Oh my gosh, guys. It's here. It's really happening. Thank you for the hosts, everybody. Um, it's here today. It's the 12 hour. Um, before I jump into reading, I just want to say thank you guys so much for being here. Um, thank you guys for... <coughs> Thank you guys for helping me get to 500 followers. Um, that's just super exciting. <laughs> this will be a 12 hour stream, so I will be going until 10 p.m. tonight. I don't know why it's saying that. Hang on one second. Hang on, I'm gonna fix it. So yes, if you have five hours of watch time, um, you need to have five hours of watch time before it'll let you enter. So um, if you don't know what your current watch time is, you can do exclamation point tickets in order to check how long you've been in the channel. Um, I just, um, I want to thank the people that have been supporting me for a while. So if you have five hours of watch time in the channel, then you can do exclamation point um, giveaway. And yeah, 500 Frilla Rouge. Yeah, get your coffee, enjoy your coffee. Yeah. So, but, um, see, you're very, very you're very close, uh, Justin. By the time I'm done reading uh, the first portion of The Vile Village, you will have five hours. So, I would suggest um, entering when you hit five hours, which will just be in like an hour. So, about 11, 11, 15, uh, you can go ahead and enter um, the giveaway. But yeah, anybody, and you can enter the giveaway throughout the whole day, and then at the end of the day, I'll let the bot randomly pick its winners. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Um, there's a lot I'm, I've got planned for today. Um, actually, real quick before I jump in, I am going to um, go over the plan for today. So, I'm going to read four chapters of The Vile Village, then I'm going to take a quick break to eat something. Then I'm going to do two hours of a Nancy Drew game, which I will install while I'm eating because it's going to be randomly picked by a number generator. At 1.45, I'll do Splatoon. At 3.15, I'm going to do some coloring and uh, pick cross puzzles. Um, at 4.30, I'll jump into the end of Detective Pikachu. 6.30, I'm going to break for dinner. 6.50, we'll come back with Jackbox. And at 9, we'll do Spill It or Fill It. I should put my schedule up on the screen, but... I'm going to be archiving these, and that might be weird for, like, people who are watching this later. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Can you guys hear the music still okay a little bit in the background? Okay. I'm going to, I'll read the back of the book to you. Dear reader, you have undoubtedly picked up this book by mistake, so please put it down. Nobody in their right mind would read this particular book about the lives of Violet Klaus and Sunny Baudelaire on purpose, because each dismal moment of their stay in the village of VFD has been faithfully and dreadfully recorded in these pages. I can think of no single reason why anyone would want to open a book containing such unpleasant matters as migrating crows, an angry mob, a newspaper headline, the arrest of innocent people, the deluxe cell, and some very strange hats. It is my solemn and sacred op occupation to research each detail of the Baudelaire children's lives and write them all down, but you may prefer to do some other solemn and sacred thing, such as reading another book instead. With all due respect, Lemony Snicket. Thank you, Riddy, for the host. Oh, thank you, Tomas. That was so sweet of you. I'll cut this up a little bit. All right. <clears throat> for Beatrice, when we were together, I felt breathless. Now, you are. The Vile Village. Chapter 1. No matter who you are, no matter where you live, and no matter how many people are chasing you, what you don't read is often as important as what you do read. 
For instance, if you are walking in the mountains and you don't read the sign that says beware of cliff because you are busy reading a joke book instead, you may suddenly find yourself walking on air rather than a sturdy bed of rocks. If you are baking a pie for your friends and you read an article entitled how to build a chair instead of a cookbook, your pie will probably end up tasting like wood and nails instead of like crust and fruity filling. And if you insist on reading this book instead of something more cheerful, you will most certainly find yourself moaning in despair instead of wriggling in delight. So if you have any sense at all, you will put this book down and pick up another one. I know of a book, for instance, called The Littlest Elf, which tells the story of a teensy weensy little man who scurries around fairyland having all sorts of adorable adventures, and you can see at once that you should probably read The Littlest Elf and wriggle over the lovely things that happen to this imaginary creature in a made-up place instead of reading this book and moaning over the terrible things that happened to the three Baudelaire orphans in the village where I am now typing these very words. The misery, woe, and treachery contained in the pages of this book are so dreadful that it is important that you don't read any more of it than you already have. The Baudelaire orphans at the time this story begins were certainly wishing that they weren't reading the newspaper that was in front of their eyes. A newspaper, as I'm sure you know, is a collection of supposedly true stories written down by writers who either saw them happen or talked to people who did. These writers are called journalists, and like telephone operators, butchers, ballerinas, and people who clean up after horses, journalists can sometimes make mistakes. This was certainly the case with the front page of the morning edition of the Daily Punctilio, which the Baudelaire children were reading in the office of Mr. Poe. Twins captured by Count Omar! The headline read, and the three siblings looked at one another in amazement over the mistakes that the Daily Punctilio's journalists had made. Duncan and Isadora Quagmire, Violet read out loud, twin children who are the only known surviving members of the Quagmire family, have been kidnapped by the notorious Count Omar. Omar is wanted by the police for a variety of dreadful crimes and is easily recognized by his one long eyebrow and the tattoo of an eye on his left ankle. Omar has also kidnapped Esme Squalor, the city's sixth most fi important financial advisor, for reasons unknown. Ugh! The word ugh was not in the newspaper, of course, but it was something Violet uttered herself as a way of saying she was way too disgusted to read any further. If I invented something as sloppily as this newspaper writes its stories, she said, it would fall apart immediately. Violet, who at 14 was the eldest Baudelaire child, was an excellent inventor and spent a great deal of time with her hair tied up in a ribbon to keep it out of her eyes as she thought of new mechanical devices. And if I read books so sloppily, Klaus said, I wouldn't remember one single fact. Klaus, the middle Baudelaire, had read more books than just about anyone his own age, which was almost 13. At many crucial moments, his sisters had relied on him to remember a helpful fact from a book he had read years before. Cretchen, Sonny said. Sonny, the youngest Baudelaire, was a baby scarcely larger than a watermelon. Like many infants, Sonny often said words that were difficult to understand, like Cretchen, which meant something along the lines of, and if I used my big four teeth to bite something so sloppily, I wouldn't even leave one tooth mark. Violet moved the paper closer to one of the reading lamps Mr. Poe had in his office and began to count the errors that had appeared in the few sentences she had read. For one thing, she said, the Quagmires aren't twins, they're triplets. The fact that their brother perished in the fire that killed their parents doesn't change their birth identity. Of course it doesn't, Klaus agreed, and they were kidnapped by Count Olaf, not Omar. It's difficult enough that Olaf is already in disguise, but now the newspapers disguise his name, too. Esme, Sunny added, and her siblings nodded. The youngest Baudelaire was talking about the part of the article that mentioned Esme Squalor. Esme and her husband Jerome had recently been the Baudelaire's guardians, and the children had, been, had seen with their own eyes that Esme had not been kidnapped by Count Olaf. Esme had secretly helped Olaf with his evil scheme and had escaped with him at the last minute. And for reasons unknown is the biggest mistake of all, Violet said glumly. The reasons aren't unknown. We know them. We know the reasons Esme, Count Olaf, and all of Olaf's associates have done so many terrible things. It's because they're terrible people. Violet put down the daily punctilio, looked around Mr. Poe's office, and joined her siblings in a sad, deep sigh. The Baudelaire orphans were sighing not only for the things they had read, but for the things they hadn't read. The article had not mentioned that both the Quagmires and the Baudelaires had lost their parents in a terrible fire, and that both sets of parents had left enormous fortunes behind, and that Count Olaf had cooked up all of his evil plans just to get a hold of these fortunes for himself. 
The newspaper had failed to note that the Quagmire triplets had been kidnapped while trying to help the Baudelaire's escape from Count Olaf's clutches, and that the Baudelaire's had almost managed to rescue the Quagmires, only to find them snatched away once more. The journalist who wrote the story had not included the fact that Duncan Quagmire, who was a journalist himself, and Isadora Quagmire, who was a poet, e each kept a notebook with them whenever they went. That in their notebooks they had written down a terrible secret that they had discovered about Count Olaf, but that all the Baudelaire orphans knew of this secret were the initials VFD, and that Violet Klaus and Sonny were always thinking of these three letters and what ghastly thing they could stand for. But most of all, the Baudelaire orphans had read no word about the fact that the Quagmire triplets were good friends of theirs, and that the three siblings were very worried about the Quagmires, and that every night when they tried to go to sleep, their heads were filled with terrible images of what could be happening to their friends, who were practically the only happy thing in the lives of the Baudelaire since they had received the news of the fire that killed their parents, and began the series of unfortunate events that seemed to follow them wherever they went. The article in the Daily Punctilio probably did not mention these details because the journalist who wrote the story did not know them, or did not think they were important. But the Baudelaire's knew about them, and the three children sat together for a few moments and thought quietly about these very, very important details. A fit of coughing coming from the doorway of the office brought them out of their thoughts, and the Baudelaire's turned to see Mr. Poe coughing into a white handkerchief. Mr. Poe was a banker who had been placed in charge of the orphan's care after the fire, and I'm sorry to say he was extremely prone to error, a phrase which here means always had a cough, and had placed the three Baudelaire children in an assortment of dangerous positions. The first guardian Mr. Poe found for the youngsters was Count Olaf himself, and the most recent guardian he had found for them was Esme Squalor, and in between, he had placed the children in a variety of circumstances that turned out to be just as unpleasant. This morning, they were supposed to learn about their new home, but so far, all Mr. Poe had done was have several coughing fits and leave them alone with a poorly written newspaper. Good morning, children, Mr. Poe said. I'm sorry I kept you waiting, but ever since I was promoted to vice president in charge of orphan affairs, I've been very, very busy. Besides, finding you a new home has been something of a chore. He walked over to his desk, which was covered in piles of papers, and sat down in a large chair. I've put calls in to a variety of distant relatives, but they've heard all of the terrible things that tend to happen wherever you go. Understandably, they're too skittish about Count Olaf to agree to take care of you. Skittish means nervous, by the way. There's one more- One of the three telephones on Mr. Poe's desk interrupted him with a loud, ugly ring. Excuse me, the banker said to the children and began to speak into the receiver. Poe here. Okay. 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 I thought so. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fagan. Mr. Poe hung up the phone and made a mark on one of the papers on his desk. That was a 19th cousin of yours, Mr. Poe said, and the last hope of mine. I thought I could persuade him to take you in just for a couple of months, but he refused. I can't say I blame him. I'm concerned that your reputation as troublemakers is even ruining the reputation of my bank. But we're not troublemakers, Klaus said. Count Olaf is the troublemaker. Mr. Poe took the newspaper from the children and looked at it carefully. Well, I'm sure the story in the Daily Punctilia will help the authorities finally capture Olaf and then your relatives can be less skittish. This story is full of mistakes, Violet said. The authorities won't even know his real name. This newspaper call calls him Omar. The story was a disappointment to me too, Mr. Poe said. The journalist said that the paper would put a photograph of me next to the article with a caption about my promotion. I had my hair cut for it specifically. It would have made my wife and sons very proud to see my name in the papers, so I understand why you're disappointed that the article is about the Quagmire Twins instead of it being about you. We don't care about having our names in the newspaper, Klaus said, and besides, the Quagmires are triplets, not twins. The death of their brother changes their birth identity, Mr. Poe explained sternly, but I don't have time to talk about this. We need to find... Another one of his phones rang, and Mr. Poe excused himself again. Poe here, he said into the receiver. No. 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 Yes. 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 I don't care. Goodbye. He hung up the phone and coughed into his white handkerchief before wiping his mouth and turning once more to the children. Well, that phone call solved all of your problems, he said simply. The Baudelaire's looked at one another. Had Count Olaf been arrested? Had the Quagmires been saved? Had someone invented a way to go back in time and rescue their parents from a terrible fire? How could all of their problems have been solved with just one phone call to a banker? Plin? Sonny asked. 
Mr. Post smiled. Have you ever heard the aphorism, he said, it takes a village to raise a child. The children looked at one another again, a little less hopefully this time. The quoting of an aphorism like the angry barking of a dog or the smell of overcooked broccoli rarely indicates that something helpful is about to happen. An aphorism is merely a small group of words arranged in a certain order because they sound good that way, but oftentimes people tend to say them as if they were saying something very mysterious and wise. I know it probably sounds mysterious to you, Mr. Poe continued, but the aphorism is actually very wise. It takes a village to raise a child means that the responsibility for taking care of youngsters belongs to everyone in the community. I think I read something about this aphorism in a book about the Mabuti Pygmies. Um, Klaus said, are you sending us to live in Africa? Don't be silly, Mr. Poe said, as if the millions of people who lived in Africa were ridiculous. That was the city government on the telephone. A number of villages just outside the city have signed up for a new guardian program based on the aphorism it takes a village to raise a child. Orphans are sent to these villages and everyone who, who lives there raises them together. Normally, I approve of more traditional family structures, but this is really quite convenient and your parents will instruct that you be raised in the most convenient way possible. You mean the entire town would be in charge of us? Violet asked, that's a lot of people. Well, I imagine they would take turns, Mr. Poe said, stroking his chin. It's not as if you would be tucked into bed by 3,000 people at once. Snoida, Sunny shrieked. She meant something like, I prefer to be tucked into bed by my siblings, not by strangers. But Mr. Poe was busy looking through his papers on his desk and didn't answer her. Apparently, I was mailed a brochure about this program several weeks ago, he said, but I guess it got lost somewhere on my desk. Oh, here it is. Take a look for yourselves. Mr. Poe reached across his desk to hand them a colorful brochure, and the Baudelaire orphans took a look for themselves. On the front was the, was the aphorism, It Takes a Village to Raise a Child, written in flowery letters, and inside the brochure were photographs of children with such huge smiles that the Baudelaire's mouths ached just to look at them. A few paragraphs explained that 99% of the orphans participating in this program were overjoyed to have whole villages taking care of them, and that all the towns listed on the back page were eager to serve as guardians for any interested children who'd lost their parents. The three Baudelaire's looked at the grinning photographs and read the flowery aphorism and felt a little flutter in their stomachs. They felt more than a little nervous about having a whole town for a guardian. It was strange enough when they were in the care of various relatives. How strange would it feel if hundreds of people were trying to act as substitute Baudelaire's? Do you think we would be safe from Count Olaf? Violet asked hesitantly. If we lived with an entire village? I should think so, Mr. Poe said and coughed it to his handkerchief. With a whole village looking after you, you'll probably be the safest you've ever been. Plus, thanks to the story in the Daily Punctilio, I'm sure Omar will be captured in no time. Olaf, Klaus corrected. Yes, yes, Mr. Poe said. I meant to say Omar. Now what villages are listed in the brochure? You children can choose your new hometown if you like. Klaus turned the brochure over and read from the list of towns. Paltryville, he said. That's where the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill was. We had a terrible time there. Calton, Sunny shrieked, which meant something like, I wouldn't return there for all the tea in China. The next village on the list is Tedia, Klaus said. That name's unfamiliar to me. That's near where Uncle Monty lived, Violet said. Let's not live there. It'll make us miss Uncle Monty even more than we already do. Klaus nodded in agreement. Besides, he said the town is near Lousy Lane, so it probably smells like horseradish. Here's a village I've never heard of, Ophelia. No, no. Mr. Poe said, I won't have you living in the same town as the Ophelia Bank. It's one of my least favorite banks, and I don't want to have to walk by it when I visit you. Zounce, Sunny said, which meant that's ridiculous. But Klaus nudged her with his elbow and pointed to the next village listed on the brochure, and Sunny quickly changed her tune, a phrase which here means immediately said gounce instead, which meant something along the lines of, let's live there. Gounce indeed, Klaus agreed and showed Violet what he and Sunny were talking about. Violet gasped and the three siblings looked at one another and felt a little flutter in their stomachs again. But this was less of a nervous flutter and more of a hopeful one, a hope that maybe Mr. Poe's last phone call really had solved all of their problems and that maybe what they read right here in the brochure would turn out to be more important than what they didn't read in the newspaper. For at the bottom of the list of villages below Paltryville and Tedia and Ophelia was the most important thing they had read all morning. Printed in the flowery script on the back page of the brochure Mr. Poe had given them were the letters VFD. End of chapter one.
Let's catch up. Makeup on fleek, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Riddy. <gasps> um, hello, person I don't know that just subbed to me. Thank you. <laughs> I'm catching up on the chat. Hang on one second, I'll get to you. Spoilers. <laughs> Why don't they get help from Nancy Drew? I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, Riddy. Hi, Shannon. Thank you so much, Shannon. Be safe on your way to work. Yay, Moocher. <laughs> oh no, I'm afraid to burn up. You got a Wi Fi hotspot in the car? Yeah. Hi, Stuart. How are you? You're here for ASMR. Yes, yes, Omlof. I think Mr. Poe is a five-year-old in disguise. Yes, yes, come. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, Moocher gifted a sub to a user. Okay. That's what that is. Hey, Jordan, how are you? Hope you're doing well today. What is that badge? Owl All Access Pass? I don't know what that is. Thanks for being here. Wow, okay, Moocher. <laughs> you heard hello? Hi, Heartless. Oh, Overwatch League. Oh, oh, oh okay, okay. <clears throat> Okay, let me take a little sip of water. Thank you all for being here. Um, I don't know. Um, please know that the giveaway is open to anybody who has five hours or more of uh, watch time. And if you've entered once, you can't enter again, but... Literally anyone can enter. The giveaway will be three secret merch items that I am having made. I will announce what you win at the end, but it's three merch things um, that I'm having created that I think are kind of neat. So, yeah, you can enter throughout the whole day, um, the whole 12 hour you can enter, and then at the end of the stream, I'll let the bot pick. <clears throat> Yeah, what Tara said. You can do exclamation point tickets and check how many hours you have. It's a sign green screen from Russia with a bear painted on now. <laughs> so, so yep, just up there in the corner, exclamation point giveaway. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and jump right into chapter two. Chapter two. When you are traveling by bus, it is always difficult to decide whether you should sit in a seat by the window, a seat on the aisle, or a seat in the middle. If you take an aisle seat, you have the advantage of being able to stretch your legs whenever you like, but you have the disadvantage of people walking by you and they can accidentally step on your toes or spill something on your clothing. 
If you take a window seat, you have the advantage of getting a clear view of the scenery, but you have the disadvantage of watching insects die as they hit the glass. If you take a middle seat, you have neither of these advantages, and you have the added disadvantage of people leaning all over you when they fall asleep. You could see at once why you should always arrange to hire a limousine or rent a mule rather than take the bus to your destination. The Baudelaire orphans, however, did not have the money to hire a limousine, and it would have taken them several weeks to reach VFD by mule, so they were traveling to their new home by bus. The children had thought that it might take a lot of effort to convince Mr. Poe to choose VFD as their new village guardian, but right when they saw the three initials on the brochure, one of Mr. Poe's telephones rang, and by the time he was off the phone, he was too busy to argue. All he had time to do was make arrangements with the city government and take them to the bus station. As he saw them off, a phrase which here means put the Baudelaire's on a bus rather than doing the polite thing and taking them to their new home personally, he instructed them to report to the town hall of VFD and made them promise not to do anything that would ruin his bank's reputation. Before they knew it, Violet was sitting in an aisle seat, brushing dirt off her coat and rubbing her sore toes, and Klaus was sitting in a window seat, gazing at the scenery through a layer of dead bugs. Sunny sat between them, gnawing on the armrest. No lean, she said sternly, and her brother smiled. Don't worry, Sonny, he said. We'll make sure not to lean on you if we fall asleep. We don't have much time for napping anyway. We should be at VFD any minute now. What do you think it could stand for? Violet asked. Neither the brochure nor the map at the bus station showed anything more than three initials. I don't know, Klaus said. Do you think we should have told Mr. Poe about the VFD secret? Maybe he could have helped us. I doubt it, Violet said. He hasn't been very helpful before. I wish the Quagmires were here, I bet they could help us. I wish the Quagmires were here even if they couldn't help us, Klaus said, and his sisters nodded in agreement. No Baudelaire had to say anything more about how worried they were about the triplets, and they sat in silence for the rest of the ride, hoping that their arrival at VFD would bring them closer to saving their friends. VFD, the bus driver finally called out. Next stop, VFD. If you look out the window, you can see the town coming up, folks. What does it look like? Violet asked Klaus. Klaus peered out the window past the layer of dead bugs. Flat, he said. Violet and Sunny leaned over to look and saw that their brother had spoken the truth. The countryside looked as if someone had drawn the line of the horizon. The word horizon here means the boundary where the sky ends and the world begins, and then forgot to draw in nothing else. The land stretched out as far as the eye could see, but there was nothing for the eye to look at but flat, dry land and the occasional sheet of newspaper stirred up by the passing of the bus. I don't see any town at all, Klaus said. Do you suppose it's underground? Nova Dry, Sunny said, which meant living underground would be no fun at all. Maybe that's the town over there, Violet said, squinting to try and see as far as she could. You see, way out by the horizon line, there's a hazy black blur. It looks like smoke, but maybe it's just some buildings seen from far away. I can't see it, Klaus said. That smushed moth is blocking it, I think. But a hazy blur could just be a Fata Morgana. Fata? Sunny asked. Fata Morgana is when your eyes play tricks on you, particularly in hot weather, Klaus said. It's, ex it's caused by the distortion of light through alternate layers of hot and cool air. It's also called a mirage, but I like the name Fata Morgana better. Me too, Violet agreed, but let's hope it's not a mirage or a Fata Morgana. Let's hope it's VFD. VFD, the bus driver called as the bus came to a stop. VFD, everyone off for VFD. The Baudelaire's stood up, gathered their belongings, and walked down the aisle, but when they reached the open door of the bus, they stopped and stared doubtfully out at the flat and empty landscape. Is this really the stop for VFD? Violet asked the driver. I thought VFD was a town. It is, the driver replied. Just walk toward that hazy black blur out there on the horizon. I know it looks like, well, I can't remember the phrase for when your eyes play tricks on you, but it's really the town. Can you take us a little closer? Violet asked shyly. We have a baby with us, and it looks like a long way to walk. I wish I could help you, the bus driver said kindly, looking down at Sunny. But the Council of Elders has very strict rules. I have to let off all passengers for VFD right here, otherwise I could be severely punished. Who are the Council of Elders? Klaus asked. Hey, a voice called from the back of the bus. Tell those kids to hurry up and get off the bus. The open door's letting bugs in. Off you go, kids, the bus driver said, and the Baudelaire stepped out of the bus onto the flatland of VFD. The, the doors shut, and with a little wave, the bus driver drove off and left the children alone on the empty landscape. The siblings watched the bus get smaller and smaller as it drove away, but then turned toward the hazy black blur of their new home. Well, now I can see it, 
Klaus said, squinting behind his glasses. But I can't believe it. It's going to take the rest of the afternoon to walk all that way. Then we'd better get started, Violet said, hoisting Sunny up on top of her suitcase. This piece of luggage has wheels, she said to her sister, so you can sit on top of it and I can pull you along. Thanks, Sunny said, which meant that's very considerate of you. And the Baudelaire's began their long walk toward the hazy black blur on the horizon. Even after the first few steps, the disadvantages of the bus ride seemed like small potatoes. Small potatoes is a phrase which has nothing to do with root vegetables that happen to be tiny in size. Instead, it refers to the change in one's feelings for something when it is compared with something else. If you were walking in the rain, for instance, you might be worried about getting wet, but if you turned the corner and saw a pack of vicious dogs, getting wet would suddenly become small potatoes next to getting chased down an alley and barked at or possibly eaten. As the Baudelaire's began their long journey toward VFD, dead bugs stepped on toes and the possibility of someone leaning on them became small potatoes next to the far more unpleasant things they were encountering. Without anything else on the flat land to blow up against, the wind concentrated its efforts on Violet, a phrase which here means that before long her hair was so wildly tangled that it looked like it had never seen a comb. Because Klaus was standing behind Violet, the wind didn't blow on him much, but without anything else in the empty landscape to cling to, the dust on the ground concentrated its efforts on the middle Baudelaire, and soon he was dusty from head to toe, as if it had been years since he'd had a shower. Perched on top of Violet's luggage, Sunny was out of the way of the dust, but without anything else in the desolate terrain to shine on, the sun concentrated its efforts on her, which meant she was soon as sunburned as a baby who'd spent six months at a seashore instead of a few hours on top of a suitcase. But even as they approached the town, VFD still looked as hazy as it did from far away. As the children drew closer and closer to their new home, they could see a number of buildings of different heights and widths, separated by streets both narrow and wide, and the Baudelaire's could even see the tall, skinny shapes of lampposts and flagpoles stretching out toward the sky. But everything they saw, from the tip of the highest building to the curve of the narrowest street, was pitch black and seemed to be shaking slightly, as if the entire town were painted on a piece of cloth that was trembling in the wind. The buildings were trembling, and the lamp posts were trembling, and even the very streets were shaking ever so slightly, and it was like no town the three Baudelaire's had ever seen. It was a mystery, but unlike most mysteries, once the children reached the outskirts of VFD and learned what was causing the trembling effect, they did not feel any better to have this mystery solved. The town was covered in crows. Nearly every inch of nearly every object had a large black bird roosting on it and casting a suspicious eye on the children as they stood at the very edge of the village. There were crows sitting on the roofs of all the buildings, perching on the windowsills and squatting on the steps and on the sidewalks. Crows were covering all of the trees, from the very top branches to the roots poking out of the crow-covered ground, and were gathered in large groups on the streets for crow conversations. Crows were covering the lampposts and flagpoles, and there were crows laying down in the gutters and resting between fence posts. There were even six crows crowded together on the sign that read Town Hall, with an arrow leading down a crow-covered street. The crows weren't squawking or cawing, which is what crows often do, or playing the trumpet, which crows practically never do, but the town was far from silent. The air was filled with the sounds the crows made as they moved around. Sometimes one crow would fly from one perch to another as if it had suddenly become bored roosting on the mailbox and thought it would be more fun to perch on the doorknob of this building. Occasionally, several crows would flutter their wings as if they were stiff from sitting together on a bench and wanted to stretch a little bit. And almost constantly, the crows would shift in their places, trying to make themselves as comfortable as they could in such cramped quarters. All this motion explained why the town had looked so shivery in the distance, but it certainly didn't make the Baudelaire's feel any better, and they stood together in silence for quite some time, trying to find the courage to walk among all the fluttering black birds. I've read three books on crows, Klaus said. They're perfectly harmless. Yes, I know, Violet said. It's unusual to see so many crows in one place, but they're nothing to worry about. It's small potatoes. Zymuster, Sunny agreed, but the three children still did not take a step closer to the crow-covered town. Despite what they had said to one another, that the crows were harmless birds, that they had nothing to worry about, and Zymuster, which meant something along the lines of, it'd be silly to be afraid of a bunch of birds. The Baudelaire's felt they were encountering some very large potatoes indeed. 
If I had been one of the Baudelaire's myself, I would have stood at the edge of the town for the rest of my life, whimpering with fear, rather than even take one step into the crow-covered streets. But it only took the Baudelaire's a few minutes to work up the courage to walk through all of the muttering, scuffling birds to the town hall. This isn't as difficult as I thought it would be, Violet said in a quiet voice so as not to disturb the crow closest to her. It's not exactly small potatoes, but there's enough space between the groups of crows to step. That's true, Klaus said, his eyes on the sidewalk to avoid stepping on any crow tails. They tend to move aside just a little bit when we walk by. Raka, Sunny said, careful, crawling, crawling as carefully as she could. She meant something along the lines of, it's almost like walking through a quiet but polite crowd of very short people. And her siblings smiled in agreement. <clears throat> Before too long, they had walked the entire block of the crow-lined street, but there at the far corner was a tall, impressive building that appeared to be made of white marble, or at least as far as the Baudelaire's could tell, because it was covered with crows as the rest of the neighborhood. <clears throat> Even the sign reading Town Hall looked like it read, Whoa, huh, because the three enormous crows were perched on it, gazing at the Baudelaire's with their tiny, beady eyes. Violet raised her hand as if to knock on the door, but then paused. What's the matter? Klaus said. Nothing, Violet replied, but her hand still hung in the air. I guess I'm just a little skittish. After all, this is the town hall of VFD. For all we know, behind this door may be the secret we've been looking for since the Quagmires were first kidnapped. But maybe we shouldn't get our hopes up, Klaus said. Remember when we lived with the Squalors? We thought we'd solved the mystery of VFD, but we were wrong. We could be wrong this time, too. But we could be right. Violet said, and if we're right, we should be prepared for whatever terrible thing is behind this door. Unless we're wrong, Klaus pointed out, then we have nothing to be prepared for. Gasku, Sunny said. She meant something along the lines of, there's no point in arguing because we'll never know whether we're right or wrong until we knock on this door. And before her siblings could answer her, she crawled around Klaus's legs and took the plunge, a phrase which here means knocked firmly on the door with her tiny knuckles. Come in! called a very grand voice, and the Vodlers opened the door and found themselves in a large room with a very high ceiling, a very shiny floor, and a very long bench, with a very detailed portrait of crows hanging on the walls. In front of the bench was a small platform where a woman in a motorcycle helmet was standing, and behind the platform were perhaps 100 folding chairs, most of which had a person sitting on them who was staring at the Baudelaire orphans. But the Baudelaire orphans were not staring back. The three children were staring so hard at the people sitting on the bench that they scarcely glanced at the folding chairs at all. On the bench, sitting stiffly side by side, were 25 people who had two things in common. The first thing was that they were all quite old. The youngest person on the bench, a woman sitting on the far end, looked about 81 years of age and everyone else looked quite a bit older. But the second thing they had in common was far more interesting. At first glance, it looked like a few crows had flown in from the streets and roosted on the babies, the babies, the bench sitters' heads. But as the Baudelaire's looked more closely, they saw that the crows did not blink their eyes or flutter their wings or move at all in any way. And the children realized that they were nothing more than black hats made in such a way to resemble actual crows. It was such a strange kind of hat to be wearing that the children found themselves staring for quite a few minutes without noticing anything else. Are you the Baudelaire orphans? asked one of the old men who was sitting on the bench in a gravelly voice. I need to change my voice. <clears throat> As he talked, his crow head flapped slightly, which only made it look more ridiculous. We've been expecting you, although I wasn't told you'd look so terrible. You three are the most windswept, dusty, and sunburned children I have ever seen. Are you sure you're the children we've been waiting for? Yes, Violet replied. I'm Violet Baudelaire, and this is my brother Klaus and my sister Sunny. And the reason why we- Shush, one of the other old men said. We're not discussing you right now. Rule number 492 clearly states the Council of Elders will only discuss things that are on the platform. Right now, we are discussing our new chief of police. Are there any questions from the townspeople regarding Officer Luciana? Yes, I have a question, called out a man in plaid pants. I want to know what happened to our previous chief of police, because I liked that guy. The woman on the platform held up a white-gloved hand, and the Baudelaire's turned to look at her for the very first time. 
Officer Luciana was a very tall woman, wearing big black boots, a blue coat with a shiny badge, and a motorcycle helmet with the visor pulled down to cover her eyes. The Baudelaire's could see her mouth, below the edge of the visor, covered in bright red lipstick. The previous chief of police has a sore throat, she said, turning her helmet to the man who had asked the question. He accidentally swallowed a box of thumbtacks. But let's not waste time talking about him. I am your new chief of police, and I will make sure that any rule breakers in town are punished properly. I can't see how there's anything more to discuss. I quite agree with you, said the first elder who had spoken as the people in folding chairs nodded. The Council of Elders hereby ends the discussion of Officer Luciana. Hector, please bring the orphans to the platform for discussion. A tall, skinny man in rumpled overalls stood up from one of the folding chairs as the chief of police stepped off the platform with a lipstick smile on. His eyes on the floor, the man walked over to the Baudelaire's and pointed first at the Council of Elders sitting on the bench and then at the empty platform. Although they would have preferred a more polite method of communication, the children understood at once, and Violet and Klaus stepped up onto the platform and then lifted Sunny up to join them. One of the women in the Council of Elders spoke up. We are now discussing the guardianship of the Baudelaire orphans. Under the new government program, the entire town of VFD will act as guardian over these three children because it takes a village to raise a child. Are there any questions? Are these the same Baudelaire's, came a voice from the back of the room, who are involved in the kidnapping of the Quagmire twins by Count Omar? The Baudelaire's turned around to see a woman dressed in a bright pink bathrobe and holding up a copy of the Daily Punctilio. It says here in the newspaper that an evil count is coming after these children. I don't want something like that in our town. We've taken care of that matter, Mrs. Morrow, replied another member of the council soothingly. We'll explain in a moment. Now when children have a guardian, the guardian makes them do chores, so it follows that you Baudelaire's will have to do all the chores for the entire village. Beginning tomorrow, you three children will be responsible for anything that anyone asks you to do. The children looked at one another in disbelief. Begging your pardon, Klaus said timidly, but there are only 24 hours in a day and there appear to be several hundred townspeople. How will we find time to do everyone's chores? Hush! Several members of the council said in unison, and then the youngest-looking woman spoke up. Rule number 920 clearly states that no one may talk while on the platform unless you are a police officer. You're orphans, not police officers, so shut up. Now due to your VFD crows, crows, due to the VFD crows, you will have to arrange your chore schedule as follows. In the morning, the crows roost uptown, so that's where you will do all your downtown chores so the crows don't get in your way. In the afternoon, as you can see, the crows roost downtown, so you will do the uptown chores then. Please pay particular attention to our new fountain, which was just installed this morning. It's very beautiful and needs to be kept as clean as possible. At night, the crows roost in Nevermore Tree, which is on the outskirts of town, so there's no problem there. Are there any questions? I have a question, said the man in plaid pants. He stood up from his folding chair and pointed at the Baudelaire's. Where are they gonna live? It may take a village to raise a child, but that doesn't mean that our homes have to be disturbed by noisy children, does it? Yes, agreed Mrs. Morrow. I'm all for the orphans doing our chores, but I don't want them cluttering up my house. Several other townspeople spoke up. Hear, hear, they said, using an, using an expression which here means, I don't want Violet Claus and Sunny Baudelaire to live with me either. One of the oldest looking elders raised both his hands up in the air. Please, he said. There is no reason for all this fuss. The children will live with Hector, our handyman. He will feed them, clothe them, and make sure they do all of the chores. And he is responsible for teaching them all of the rules of VFD so they won't do any more terrible things such as talking while on the platform. Thank goodness for that, muttered the man in plaid pants. Now Baudelaire's, said yet another member of the council. She was sitting so far from the platform that she had to crane her head to look at the children and her hat looked like it would fall off her head. Before Hector takes you to his house, I'm sure you have some concerns of your own. It's too bad you're not allowed to speak right now, otherwise you could tell us what they were. But Mr. Poe sent us some materials regarding this Count Olaf person. Omar, corrected Mrs. Morrow, pointing to the headline in the newspaper. Silence, the elder said. Now, Baudelaire's, I'm sure you are very concerned about this Olaf fellow, but as your guardian, the town will protect you. That is why we have recently made up a new rule, and this is rule number 19,833. It clearly states that no villains are allowed within the city limits. 
Here, here! The townspeople cried, and the Council of Elders nodded in appreciation, bobbing their crow-shaped hats. Now, if there are no more questions, an elder concluded, Hector, please take the Baudelaire children off the platform and to your house. Still keeping his eyes on the floor, the man in overall strode silently to the platform and led them out of the room. The children hurried to catch up with the handyman who had not said one word all this time. Was he unhappy to be taking care of three children? Was he angry at the Council of Elders? Was he unable to speak at all? It reminded the Baudelaire's of one of Count Olaf's associates, the one who looked like neither a man nor a woman and who never seemed to speak. The children kept a few steps behind Hector as he walked out of the building, almost afraid to get any closer to a man who was so strange and silent. When Hector opened the door of Town Hall and led the children back out onto the crow-covered sidewalk, he let out a big sigh, the first sound the children had heard from him. Then he looked down at each Baudelaire and gave them a gentle smile. I'm never truly relaxed, he said to them in a pleasant voice, until I've left Town, town Hall. The Council of Elders just makes me feel so very skittish. All those strict rules. It makes me so skittish I never speak during one of their council meetings, but I always feel much better the moment I walk out of that building. Now, it looks like we're going to be spending quite a bit of time together, so let's get a few things straight. Number one, call me Hector. Number two, I hope you like Mexican food because that's my specialty. And number three, I want you to see something marvelous and we're just in time. The sun's starting to set. It was true. The Baudelaire's hadn't noticed when they stepped out of Town Hall that the afternoon light had slipped away and the sun was just now beginning to dip below the horizon. It's lovely, Violet said politely, although she'd never understood all the fuss about standing around admiring sunsets. Shh, Hector said. Who cares about the sunset? Just be quiet for a minute and watch the crows. It'll happen any second now. What will happen? Klaus said. Shh, Hector said again, and then it began to happen. The Council of Elders had already told the Baudelaire's about the roosting habits of the crows, but the three children hadn't really given the matter a second thought, a phrase which here means considered, even for a second, what it would look like when thousands of crows would fly together to a new location. One of the largest crows sitting on top of the mailbox was the first to fly up in the air, and with a rustle of wings, he, or she, it was hard to tell from so far away, began to fly in a large circle over the children's heads. Then a crow from one of the town hall window sills flew up to join the first crow, and then one from a nearby bush, and then three from the street, and then hundreds of crows began to rise up at once and circle in the air, as if it was an enormous shadow that was being lifted off the town. The Baudelaire's could finally see what all the streets looked like, and they could gaze at each detail of the buildings as more and more crows left their afternoon roosts, but the children scarcely looked at the town. Instead, they looked straight up at the mysterious and beautiful sight of all those birds making a huge circle in the sky. Isn't it marvelous? Hector cried. His long skinny arms were outstretched and he had to raise his voice over the sound of all the fluttering wings. Isn't it marvelous? Violet, Klaus, and Sunny nodded in agreement and stared at the thousands of crows circling and circling above them like a mass of fluttering smoke or like black, fresh ink, such as the ink I'm using now to write down these events that somehow had found its way to the heavens. The sound of the wings sounded like a million pages being flipped, and the wind from all that fluttering blew in their grinning faces. For a moment, with all that air rushing toward them, the Baudelaire orphans felt as if they too could fly up in the air, away from Count Olaf and all their troubles, and join the circle of crows in the evening sky. Alright, let me catch up. That's the end of chapter two. I feel like a lot happened. Yeah, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you what the merch is if that will help people make the decision of whether they want or not they want to join the giveaway. Um, one will be a vinyl sticker that you can do whatever you want with, um, with one with my channel logo. Actually, I have two channel logos, so all of these merches will have one of my two channel logos on it, one of the V's. Um, and then the second prize, second place, that'll be the third place prize is the vinyl sticker. Third, second place prize is going to be... Um, a mug that I'll have made for you and sent to you and first place prize is going to be a t-shirt that I'll have made and sent to you okay let me catch up on the chat now oh no it doesn't cost you it only costs you one ticket to enter the giveaway oh yeah thanks moocher yeah no it just costs you one ticket to enter the giveaway that's it it will not have my face on it yeah my logo Yeah, you have to have watched for five hours. Hang on.
Hang on, I'm checking. Jay Gelvar is Jake. Good morning, Paige. Good morning. Oh, I'm so sorry you're sick. Yeah, hanging out for 12 whole, out, 12 whole hours. I'm kind of just like really quickly going through this because so much chat happened. Thank you for gifting a sub to, to Paige. That was sweet. Yeah, I'm gonna do them all at the end. Oh, laryngitis. It's okay to fall in the lava as long as you have a call. Yes, there are crows on the cover. Oh, no, no worries, Riddy. I know it's early for you. Please, if you need to sleep, sleep. for giveaway okay hang on I'm just scrolling I'm just scrolling I know I tried to give all of the elders a different voice work schmirk hey Nicole how are you good morning thanks for being here I'm so sorry. Oh, hey, Storm. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, 500 hype. 12 hour hype. Hey, Oxel. Oh my gosh. Hey. I've missed you. It's so good to see you. The mug sounds tempting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I would mail it to you. Okay, all right, okay. No, I'm just, I, like, obviously, I love everybody being here, but especially Oxel, like, I haven't seen her in so long in my chat. I had a dream you were streaming from 7 to 7, and I was like, dang, girl, 7 a.m., you go hard. No, I need my sleep. Yeah, just kidding. All right. I'm not playing favorites at all. Yeah, Oxel's just very elusive, yes. Okay. Um, I got two more chapters to read, yo. I wonder if I can do two chapters in 30 minutes. We love you too. Alright, I'm gonna dive back in because I'm gonna try to hit two more chapters in the next 30 minutes. Oh, yay! Hey, Sarah! Well, I'm about to jump into to chapter three, so it's good to see you, Sarah. I'm glad you're here. Okay, alright, here we go. Chapter three. <clears throat> Wasn't that marvelous, Hector said as the crows stopped circling and began to fly like an enormous black cloud over the buildings and away from the Baudelaire orphans. Wasn't that just marvelous? Wasn't that absolutely superlative? Wasn't... That means the same thing as marvelous, by the way. It certainly was, Klaus agreed, not adding that he'd known the word superlative since he was 11. I see that just about every evening, Hector says, and it always impresses me. It always makes me hungry, too. What shall we eat this evening? How about chicken enchiladas? That's a Mexican dish consisting of corn tortillas rolled around a chicken filling covered with a melted cheese and a special sauce I learned from my second grade teacher. How does that sound? That sounds delicious, Violet said. Oh good, Hector said. I don't like picky eaters. Well, it's a pretty long walk to my house, so let's talk as we go. Here, I'll carry your suitcases and you two can carry your sister. I know you had to walk from the bus stop, so she's had more than enough exercise for a baby. Hector grabbed the Baudelaire's bags and led the way down the street, which was now empty except for a few stray crow feathers. High above their heads, the crows were taking a sharp left-hand turn, and Hector raised Klaus's suitcase to point at them. I don't know if you're familiar with the expression, as the crow flies, Hector said, but it means the most direct route. 
If something is a mile away as the crow flies, that means it's the shortest way to get there. It usually has nothing to do with actual crows, but in this case it does. We're about a mile away from my home as the crow flies. As all of these crows fly, as a matter of fact. At night they roost in Nevermore Tree, which is in my backyard. But it takes us longer to get there, of course, because we have to walk through VFD instead of flying up in the air. Hector, Violet said timidly, we were wondering what exactly that VFD stood for. Oh, yes, Klaus said. Please tell us. Of course I'll tell you, Hector said, but I don't know why you're so excited about it. It's just more nonsense from the Council of Elders. The Baudelaire's looked at one another uncertainly. What do you mean? Klaus asked. Well, about 306 years ago, Hector said, a group of explorers discovered the murder of crows that we just saw. Sturo? Sonny asked. We didn't see any crows get killed, Violet said. Murder is the word for a group of crows, like a flock of geese or a herd of cows or a convention of orthodontists. Anyway, the explorers were impressed with their patterns of migration. You know, they always fly uptown in the morning, downtown in the afternoon, and over to Nevermore Tree in the evening. It's a very unusual pattern, and so the explorers were so excited by it, they decided to live here. Before too long, a town sprung up, and so they named it VFD. But what does VFD stand for? Violet asked. The Village of Foul Devotees, Hector said. Devotees is a word for people who are devoted to something, and foul means bird, Klaus finished. That's the secret of VFD, Village of Foul Devotees? What do you mean secret? Hector asked. It's not a secret. Everyone knows what those letters mean. The Baudelaire sighed with confusion and dismay, which is not a pleasant combination. What my brother means, Violet explained, is that we chose VFD to become our new guardian because we'd been told of a terrible secret, a secret with the initials VFD. Who told you about this secret? Hector asked. Some very dear friends of ours, Violet replied, Duncan and Isadora Quagmire. They discovered something about Count Olaf, but before they could tell us anything more. Hold on a minute, Hector said. Who's Count Olaf? Mrs. Morrow was talking about Count Omar. Is Olaf his brother? No, Klaus said, shuddering at the very thought of Olaf having a brother. I'm afraid the Daily Punctilio got many of the facts wrong. Well, why don't we get them right, Hector said, turning a quarter. Suppose you tell me exactly what's happened. It's sort of a long story, Violet said. Well, Hector said with a slight smile, we have sort of a long walk. Why don't you begin at the beginning? The Baudelaire's looked up at Hector, sighed, and began at the beginning, which seemed such a long way off that they were surprised they could even remember it still so clearly. Violet told Hector about the dreadful day at the beach when she and her siblings learned from Mr. Poe that their parents had been killed in the fire that had destroyed their home, and Klaus told Hector about the days they spent in Count Olaf's care. Sonny, with some help from Klaus and Violet, who translated for her, told him about poor Uncle Monty and about the terrible things that had happened to Aunt Josephine. Violet told Hector about working at Lucky Smell's Lumber Mill, and Klaus told him about enrolling at Proof Rock Preparatory School, and Sonny related the dismal time they had living with Jerome and Esme Squalor at 667 Dark Avenue. Violet told Hector about all, all Count Olaf's various disguises and about each and every one of his nefarious associates, including the hook-handed man, the two powder-faced women, the bald man with the long nose, and the one who looked like neither a man nor a woman, of whom the Baudelaire's had been reminded when Hector had been so silent. Klaus told Hector about all the quagmire triplets, and about the mysterious underground passageway that led them back to their home, and about the shadow of misfortune that had seemed to hang over them nearly every moment since that day at the beach. And as the Baudelaire's told Hector their long story, they began to feel as if the handyman was carrying more than just their suitcases. They felt as if he was carrying each word they said, as if each unfortunate event was a burden that Hector was helping them with. The story of their lives was so miserable that I cannot say they felt happy that they were telling it, but by the time Sonny concluded the whole long story, the Baudelaire's felt as if they were carrying much less. Kuhn, Sonny concluded, which Violet was quick to translate as, and that's why we chose this town, in the hopes of finding the secret of VFD, rescuing the Quagmire triplets, and defeating Count Olaf once and for all. Hector sighed. You've certainly been through in an ordeal, he said, using a word which here means a heap of trouble, most of which was Count Olaf's fault. He stopped for a second and looked at each Baudelaire. You've been very brave, all three of you, and I'll do my best to make sure you have a proper home with me, but I must tell you that I think you've hit a dead end. What do you mean? Klaus asked. I hate to add some bad news to the terrible story you've just told me, Hector said, but I think the initials that the Quagmires told you about and the initials of this town are just a coincidence. As I said, this village has been called VFD for more than 300 years. Scarcely anything has changed since then. 
The crows have always roosted in the same places. The meetings of the Council of Elders have always been at the same time every day. My father was the handyman before me, and his father was the handyman before him, and so on and so on. The only new things in this town are you three children, and the new foul fountain uptown which we'll be cleaning tomorrow. I don't see how this village could have anything to do with the secret the Quagmires discovered. The Baudelaire children looked at one another in frustration. Pojik? Sunny asked in exasperation. She meant something along the lines of, Do you mean we've come here for nothing? But Violet translated it somewhat different. What my sister means, Violet said, is that it's very frustrating to find that we're in the wrong place. We're very concerned for our friends, Klaus added, and we don't want to give up on finding them. Give up, Hector said. Who said anything about giving up? Just because the name of this town isn't helpful, that doesn't mean you're in the wrong place. We obviously have a great many chores to do, but in our spare time, we can try to find the whereabouts of Duncan and Isadora. I'm a handyman, not a detective, but I'll try to help you the best I can. We'll have to be very careful, though. The Council of Elders has so many rules that you can scarcely do anything without breaking one of them. Why does the Council have so many rules? Violet asked. Why does anyone have a lot of rules? Hector said with a shrug. So they can boss people around, I guess. Thanks to all the rules of VFD, the Council of Elders can tell people what to wear, how to talk, what to eat, and even what to build. Rule number 67, for instance, clearly states that no citizen is allowed to build or use any mechanical devices. Does that mean I can't build or use any mechanical devices? Violet asked Hector. Are my siblings and I citizens of VFD now that our town is the guardian? I'm afraid you are, Hector said. You have to follow rule number 67 along with all the other rules. But Violet's an inventor, Klaus cried. Mechanical devices are very important to her. Is that so? Hector said and smiled. Then you can be a very big help to me, Violet. He stopped walking and looked around the street as if it was full of spies instead of being completely empty. Can you keep a secret? He asked. Yes, Violet answered. Hector looked around the street once more and then leaned forward and began speaking in a very quiet voice. When the Council of Elders invented rule number 67, he said, they instructed me to remove all the inventing materials in town. What did you say? Klaus asked. I didn't say anything. Hector admitted, leading the children around another corner. The council makes me too skittish to speak, you know that. But here's what I did. I took all the materials and I hid them out in my barn, which I've been using as a sort of inventing studio. I've always wanted to have an inventing studio, Violet said. Without even realizing it, she was reaching into her pocket for her ribbon to tie her hair up and keep it out of her eyes as she was already inventing something instead of just talking about it. What have you invented so far, Hector? Just a few little things, Hector said, but I have an enormous project that's nearing completion. I've been building a self-sustaining hot air mobile home. Hot air mobile. Hot air mobile home. Nebdies? Sunny asked. She meant something like, could you explain a little bit more? But Hector needed no encouragement to keep talking about his invention. I don't know if you've ever been up in a hot air balloon, he said, but it's very exciting. You stand in this large basket with the enormous balloon over your head, and you can gaze down at the entire countryside below you spread out like a blanket. It's simply superlative. Well, my invention is nothing more than a hot air balloon, except it's much larger. Instead of one large basket, there are 12 baskets all tied together below several hot air balloons. Each basket serves as a different room, so it's like having an entire flying house. It's completely self-sustaining. Once you get up in it, you never have to go back down. In fact, if my new engine works properly, it would be impossible to get back down. The engine should last for more than 100 years, and there's a huge storage basket that I'm filling with food, beverages, clothing, and books. Once it's completed, I'll be able to fly away from VFD and the Council of Elders and everything else that makes me skittish and live forever in the air. This sounds like a marvelous invention. Violet said, but how in the world have you been able to get the engine to be self-sustaining? That's giving me something of a problem, Hector admitted, but maybe if you three took a look at it, we could fix the engine together? I'm sure Violet could be of help, Klaus said, but I'm not much of an inventor. I'm more interested in reading. Does VFD have a good library? Unfortunately, no, Hector said. Rule number 108 clearly states that the VFD library cannot contain any books that break any of the other rules. If someone in a book uses a mechanical device, for instance, that book is not allowed in the library. But there's so many rules, Klaus said. What kind of books could possibly be allowed? Not very many, Hector said, and nearly all of them are dull. There's one called The Littlest Elf that's probably the most boring book I've ever read. It's about this irritating little man who has all sorts of tedious adventures. That's too bad, Klaus said glumly. I was hoping that I could do a little research into VFD. 
The secret, that is, not the village, in my spare time. Hector stopped walking again and looked once more around the empty streets. Can you keep another secret, he asked, and the Baudelaire's nodded. The Council of Elders told me to burn all of the books that broke rule number 108, he said in a quiet voice. But I brought them to my barn instead. I have sort of a secret library there as well as a secret inventing studio. Wow, Klaus said. I've seen public libraries, private libraries, school libraries, legal libraries, reptile libraries, and grammatical libraries, but I've never a secret library. It sounds exciting. It's a bit exciting, Hector agreed, but it also makes me very skittish. The Council of Elders gets very, very angry when people break the rules. I hate to think what they'd do to me if they found out I was secretly using mechanical devices and reading interesting books. As a tour, Sunny said, which meant, don't worry, your secret's safe with us. Hector looked down at her quizzically. I don't know what Azator means, Sonny, he said, but I would guess it means don't forget about me. Violet will use the studio and Klaus will use the library, but what can we use you for? What do you like to do best? Bite, Sonny responded at once, but Hector frowned and took, a look an took another look around him. Don't say that so loudly, Sonny, he whispered. Rule number 405... 4,561 clearly states that citizens are not allowed to use their mouths for recreation. If the Council of Elders knew that you like to bite things for your own enjoyment, I can't imagine what they'd do to you. I'm sure we can find you some things to bite, but you'll have to do it in secret. Well, here we are. Hector led the Baudelaire's around one last corner and the children got their first glimpse of where they would be living. The street they had been walking on simply ended at the turn of the corner, leading them to a place as wide and as flat as the countryside they had crossed that afternoon, with just three shapes standing out there in the flat horizon. The first was a large, sturdy-looking house with a pointed roof and a big front porch to contain a picnic table and four wooden chairs. The second was an enormous barn right next to the house that hid the studio and library Hector had been talking about, but it was the third shape that caused the Baudelaire's to stare. The third shape on the horizon was never more tree, but to simply say it was a tree would be like saying the Pacific Ocean was a body of water, or that Count Olaf was a grumpy person, or that the story of Beatrice and myself was just a little bit sad. Nevermore tree was gargantuan, a word which here means having attained an inordinate amount of botanical volume, a phrase which here means it was the biggest tree the Baudelaire's had ever seen. Its trunk was so wide that the Baudelaire's could have stood behind it along with an elephant, three horses, and an opera singer and not have been seen from the other side. Its branches spread out in every direction like a fan that was taller than the house and wider than the barn and the tree was made even taller and wider by what was sitting in it. Every last VFD crow was roosting in its branches, adding a thick layer of muttering black shapes to the immense silhouette of the tree. Because the crows had gotten to Hector's house as the crow flies instead of walking, the birds had arrived long before the Baudelaire's and the air was filled with the quiet rustling sounds of the birds settling in for the evening. A few of the birds had already fallen asleep and the children could hear a few crow snores as they approached their new home. What do you think? Hector asked. It's marvelous, Violet said. It's superlative, Klaus said. Ogufod, Sonny said, which meant what a lot of crows! The noises of the crows might sound strange at first, Hector said, leading the way up the steps of the house, but you'll get used to them before long. I always leave the windows open when I go to bed. The sounds of the crows remind me of the ocean, and I find it very peaceful to listen to them as I drift off to sleep. Speaking of bed, I'm sure you must be very tired. I've prepared three rooms for you upstairs, but if you don't like them, you can choose other ones. There's plenty of room in the house. There's even room for the quagmires to live here when we find them. It sounds like the five of you would be happy living together, even if you had to do the chores of the entire town. That does sound delightful, Violet said, smiling at Hector. It made the children happy just to think of the two triplets being safe and sound instead of in Count Olaf's clutches. Duncan's a journalist, so maybe he could start a newspaper. Then VFD wouldn't have to read all the mistakes in the Daily Punctilio. And Isadora's a poet, Klaus said. She could write a book of poetry for the library as long as she didn't write poetry about things that were against the rules. Hector started to open the door of his house, but he paused and he gave the Baudelaire's a strange look. A poet, he asked. What kind of poetry does she write? Couplets, Violet replied. Hector gave the children a look that was even stranger. He put down the Baudelaire's suitcases and reached into the pocket of his overalls. Couplets, he asked. Yes, Klaus said. She likes to write rhyming poems that are two lines long. Hector gave the youngsters a look that was one of the strangest they'd ever seen and he took his hand out of his pocket to show them a scrap of paper rolled into a tiny scroll. Like this? He asked and unrolled the paper. 
The Baudelaire orphans had to squint to read it in the dying light of the sunset, and when they read it once, they had to read it again just to make sure the light wasn't playing tricks on them and they had read what was really there on the scrap of paper in shaky but familiar handwriting. For sapphires we are held in here. Only you can end our fear. That's end of chapter three. Let me catch up, and I think I will have time to finish chapter four before 10.30. 12, 11.30. Getting too wild at my friend's lake house. Good, good, good. No. <laughs> no. Not Harry Potter. What if someone actually murdered a murder of crows? <laughs> Murder squared. Claus equals Harry. Okay, see you later, Nicole. I probably missed you, but... Yeah, I, this is all calming and soothing Pokemon music compilation. You're so close, Justin. I want a hot air mobile home. Yeah, me too. Oh, thank you. Oh, man. I'll have to... I'll have to... If you post that in Discord, I'll make sure to watch it later. You do. No, 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 no. Just five hours total watch time. It's okay. Oh, yeah, please get some sleep, Stuart. Feel better. I think Stuart's in Scotland. I am reading them in order, Sarah, yes. Yeah, you can only enter once. <laughs> Um, I am part of a Discord, but I don't have my own Discord, and I probably won't start one. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna jump into Chapter 4, and then we're gonna take a break. Well, yeah, and we're go I'm gonna let a number generator pick my Nancy Drew game, and it will install while I take a break and eat some foods. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Chapter 4. The Baudelaire orphan stared at the scrap of paper, and then at Hector, and then at the scrap of paper again. Then they stared at Hector again, and then they stared at the scrap of paper once more, and then at Hector once more, and then at the scrap of paper once again, and then at Hector once again, and then at the scrap of paper one more time. Their mouths were open as if they were about to speak, but the three children could not find the words they wanted to say. The expression, a bolt from the blue, describes something so surprising it makes your head spin, your legs wobble, and your body buzz with astonishment, as if a bolt of lightning suddenly came down from a clear blue sky and struck you at full force. Unless you are a light bulb, an electrical appliance, or a tree that is tired of standing upright, encountering a bolt from the blue is not a pleasant experience, and for a few minutes the Baudelaire stood on the steps of Hector's house and felt the unpleasant sensations of spinning heads, wobbly legs, and buzzing bodies. My goodness, Baudelaire's, Hector said. I've never seen anyone look so surprised. Here, come in the house and sit down. You look like a bolt of lightning just hit you at full force. The Baudelaire's followed Hector into his house and sat down and down a hallway to the parlor where they sat down on a couch without a word. Why don't you just sit here for a few minutes, he said. I'm going to fix you some hot tea. Maybe by the time it's ready, you'll be able to talk. He leaned down and handed the scrap of paper to Violet and gave Sonny a little pat on the head before walking out of the parlor and leaving the children alone. Without speaking, Violet unrolled the paper so the siblings could read the couplet again. For sapphires we are held in here. 
Only you can end our fear. It's her, Klaus said, speaking so quietly that Hector wouldn't hear him. I'm sure of it. Isadora Quagmire wrote this poem. I think so too, Violet said. I'm positive it's her handwriting. Blake, Sonny asked, which meant, and the poem is written in Isadora's distinct literary style. The poem talks about sapphires, Violet said, and the triplet's parents were left behind, left behind the famous Quagmire sapphires when they died. Olaf kidnapped them to get hold of those sapphires, Klaus said. That must be what it means by, for sapphires we are held in here. Peng? Sonny asked. I don't know how Hector got hold of this, Violet replied. Let's ask him. Not so fast, Klaus said. He took the poem from Violet and looked at it again. Maybe Hector's involved in the kidnapping in some way. I hadn't thought of that, Violet said. Do you really think so? I don't know, Klaus said. He doesn't seem like one of Count Olaf's associates, but sometimes we haven't been able to recognize them. Rurb, Sonny said thoughtfully, which meant that's true. He seems like someone we can trust, Violet said. He was excited to show us the migration of the crows, and he wanted to hear all about everything that's happened to us. That doesn't sound like a kidnapper, but I suppose there's no way of knowing for sure. Exactly, Klaus said. There's no way of knowing for sure. The tea's all ready, Hector called from the next room. If you're up to it, why don't you join me in the kitchen? You can sit at the table while I make the enchiladas. The Bodlers looked at one another and nodded. Kay, Sunny called and led her siblings into a large and cozy kitchen. The children took seats around a took seats around a round wooden table where Hector had placed three steaming mugs of tea and sat quietly while Hector began to prepare dinner. It is true, of course, that is that there is no way of knowing for sure whether or not you can trust someone, for the simple reason that circumstances change all the time. You might know someone for several years, for instance, and trust him completely as your friend, but circumstances could change and he could become very hungry, and before you knew it, he could be you could be boiling in a soup pot because there is no way of knowing for sure. I myself fell in love with a wonderful woman who was so charming and intelligent that I trusted that she would be my bride, but there was no way of knowing for sure, and all too soon circumstances changed and she ended up marrying someone else, all because of something she read in the Daily Punctilio. And no one had to tell the Baudelaire orphans that there was no way of knowing for sure, because before they became orphans, they lived for many years in the care of parents, in the care of their parents, and trusted their parents to keep on caring for them. But circumstances changed, and now their parents were dead, and the children were living with a handyman in a town full of crows. But even though there is no way of knowing for sure, there are often ways to know for pretty sure, and as the three sibling siblings watched Hector work in the kitchen, they spotted some of those ways. The tune he hummed as he chopped the ingredients, for instance, was a comforting one, and the Bodlers could not imagine that a person could hum like that if he were a kidnapper. When he saw that the Bodlers' tea was still too hot to sip, he walked over to the kitchen and blew on each of their mugs to cool it, and it was hard to believe that someone could be hiding two triplets and cooling three children's tea at the same time. And most comforting of all, Hector didn't pester them with a lot of questions about why they were so surprised and so silent. He simply kept quiet and let the Baudelaire's wait until they were ready to speak about the scrap of paper he'd given them, and the children could not imagine that such a considerate person was involved with Count Olaf in any way whatsoever. There was no way of knowing for sure, of course, but as the Baudelaire's watched the handyman place the enchiladas in the oven to bake, they felt as if they knew for pretty sure, and by the time he sat down and joined them at the table, they were ready to tell him about the couplet they had read. This poem was written by Isadora Quagmire, Klaus said without preamble, a phrase which here means almost as soon as Hector sat down. Wow, Hector said, no wonder you were so surprised. But how can you be so sure? Lots of poets write couplets, Ogden Nash, for instance. Ogden Nash doesn't write about sapphires, said Klaus, who had received a biography of Ogden Nash for his seventh birthday. Isadora does. When the Quagmire parents died, they left behind a fortune of sapphires. That's what she means by for sapphires we are held in here. Besides, Violet said, it's Isadora's handwriting and distinct literary style. Well, H Hector said, if you say this poem is by Isadora Quagmire, then I believe you. We should call Mr. Poe and tell him, Klaus said. We can't call him, Hector said. There are no telephones in VFD because telephones are mechanical devices. The Council of Elders can send a message to him. I'm too skittish to ask them, but you can do so if you wish. Well, before we talk to the Council, we should know a bit more about the couplet, Violet said. Where did you get a hold of this scrap of paper? I found it today, Hector said beneath the branches of Nevermore Tree. I woke up this morning and I was just leaving to walk downtown to do the morning chores when I noticed something white among all the black feathers the crows had left behind. It was this scrap of paper all rolled up in a little scroll. 
I didn't understand what was written on it and I needed to get the chores done so I put it in the pocket of my overalls and I didn't think of it again until just now when you were talking about couplets. It's certainly very mysterious. How in the world did one of Isadora's poems end up in my backyard? Well, poems don't get up and walk by themselves, Violet said. Isadora must have put it here. She must be someplace nearby. Hector shook his head. I don't think so, he said. You saw for yourself how flat it is around here. You can see everything for miles around, and the only things here on the outskirts of town are the house, the barn, and the Nevermore tree. You're welcome to search the house, but you're not going to find Isidore, Quagmire, or anyone else, and I always keep the barn locked because I don't want the Council of Elders to find out I'm breaking rules. Maybe she's in the tree, Klaus said. It's certainly big enough that Olaf could hide her in the branches. That's true, Violet said. Last time Olaf was keeping them far below us, maybe this time they're far above us. She shuddered, thinking of how unpleasant it would be to find yourself trapped in Nevermore Tree's enormous branches, and she pushed her chair back from the table and stood up. There's only one thing to do, she said. We'll have to go up and look for them. You're right, Klaus said and stood up beside her. Let's go. Gerhit, Sunny agreed. Well, hang on just a minute, Hector said. We can't go climbing up Nevermore Tree. Why not, Violet said. We've climbed up a tower and down an elevator shaft. Climbing a tree should be no problem. I'm sure you three are fine climbers, Hector said, but that's not what I mean. He stood up and walked over to the kitchen window. Take a look outside, he said. The sun has completely set. It's not light enough to see a friend of yours up in Nevermore Tree. Besides, the tree is covered in roosting birds. You'll never be able to climb through all of those crows. It'd be a wild goose chase. The Bodlers looked out the window and saw that Hector was right. The tree was merely an enormous shadow, blurry around the edges where the birds were roosting. The children knew that a climb in such darkness would be indeed a wild goose chase, a phrase which here means unlikely to reveal the quagmire triplet's location. Klaus and Sunny looked at their sister hoping that she could invent a solution and were relieved to hear she had thought of something before she could even tie her hair back in a ribbon. We could climb with flashlights, Violet said. If you have some tin foil, an old broom handle, and three rubber bands, I can make a flashlight myself in ten minutes. Hector shook his head. Flashlights would only disturb the crows, he said. If someone woke you up in the middle of the night and shone a light in your face, you would be very annoyed, and you don't want to be surrounded by thousands of annoyed crows. It's better to wait until morning when the crows have migrated uptown. We can't wait until morning, Klaus said. We can't wait another second. The last time we found them, we left them alone for a few minutes, and then they were gone again. All a move, Sunny shrieked, which meant Olaf could move them at any time. Well, he can't move them now, Hector pointed out. It would be just as difficult for him to climb the tree. We have to do something, Violet insisted. This poem isn't just a couplet. It's a cry for help. Isadora herself says only you can end our fear. Our friends are frightened, and it's up to us to rescue them. Hector took some oven mitts out of the pocket of his overalls and used them to take the enchiladas out of the oven. I'll tell you what, he said. It's a nice evening, and our chicken enchiladas are done. We can sit out on the porch, eat our dinner, and keep an eye on Nevermore Tree. The area is so flat that even at night you can see for quite a distance, and if Count Olaf approaches, or anybody else for that matter, we will see him coming. But Count Olaf might perform his treachery after dinner, Klaus said. The only way to make sure that nobody approaches the tree is to watch the tree all night. We could take turns sleeping, Violet said, so that one of us is always awake to keep watch. Hector started to shake his head, but then stopped and looked at the children. Normally I don't approve of children staying up late, he said finally, unless they're reading a very good book, seeing a wonderful movie, or attending a dinner party with fascinating guests. But this time I will make an exception. I'll probably fall asleep, but you three can keep watch all night if you wish. Just please don't try to climb Nevermore Tree in the dark. I understand how frustrated you are, and I know that the only thing we can do is wait until morning. The butlers looked at one another and sighed. They were so anxious about the quagmires that they wanted to run right out and climb Nevermore Tree, but they knew in their hearts that Hector was right. I guess you're right, Hector, Violet said. We can wait until the morning. It's the only thing we can do, Klaus agreed. Contraire, Sunny said, and held up her arms so Klaus could pick her up. She meant something along the lines of, I can think of something else we can do. Hold me up to the window latch. And her brother did so. Sunny's tiny fingers undid the latch of the window and pushed it open, letting in the cool evening air and the muttering sound of the crows. Then she leaned forward as far as she could and stuck her head out into the night. Bark! she cried out as loudly as she could. Bark! There are many expressions to describe someone who is, about to, who is going about something in the wrong way. Making a mistake is one way to describe this situation. Screwing up is another, although it's a bit rude. And attempting to rescue Lemony Snicket by writing letters to a congressman instead of digging an escape tunnel is a third way, although it's a bit specific. But Sunny calling out BARK brings to mind an expression that, sadly enough, describes the expression perfectly. The situation perfectly. By BARK, 
Sunny meant, if you're up there, Quagmires, hang on, we'll get out to you first thing in the morning. And I'm sorry to say that the expression was, which best describes her circumstances is barking up the wrong tree. It was a kind gesture of Sonny's to try to reassure Isadora and Duncan that the Baudelaire's would help them escape from Count Olaf's clutches, but the youngest Baudelaire was going about it the wrong way. Bark, she cried one more time, as Hector began to dish up the chicken enchiladas and led the Baudelaire's to the front porch so they could eat at the picnic table and keep an eye on Nevermore Tree, but Sonny was making a mistake. The Baudelaire's did not realize the mistake as they finished their dinner and kept their eye on the immense muttering tree. They did not realize the mistake as they sat on the porch for the rest of the night, taking turns at squinting at the flat horizon for any sign of someone approaching and dozing beside Hector, using the picnic table as a pillow. But when the sun began to rise and one VFD crow left Nevermore Tree and began to fly in a circle, and three more crows followed, and then seven more, and then twelve more, and soon the morning sky was filled with the sound of fluttering wings as the thousands of crows circled and circled above the children's heads as they rose from the wooden chairs and walked quickly toward the tree to look for any sign of the quagmires. The Baudelaire saw at once how deeply mistaken they had been. Without the murder of crows roosting in its branches, Nevermore Tree looked as bare as a skeleton. There was not a single leaf among the hundreds and hundreds of the tree's branches. Standing on its scraggly roots and looking up into the empty branches, the Baudelaire's could see every last detail of Nevermore Tree, and they could see at once that they would not find Duncan and Isadora Quagmire no matter how far they climbed. It was an enormous tree, and it was a sturdy tree, and it was apparently very comfortable to roost in, but it was the wrong tree. Klaus had been barking up the wrong tree when he'd said their kidnapped friends were probably up there, and Violet had been barking up the wrong tree when she said that they should climb up there and look for them, and Sunny had been barking up the wrong tree when she'd said bark. The Baudelaire orphans had been barking up the wrong tree all evening because the only thing the children found that morning was another scrap of paper rolled into a scroll among all the black feathers that the crows had left behind. End of chapter four, end of section. Let me catch up. Oh, the, the hostile hospital's your favorite? That's one of my least favorites. Geets. <laughs> Oh, you passed summer, yay! I'll come over for Rob next. That sounds like a fresh one. Rule one, don't hurt the crows. Don't sweat here. I don't think I've ever been to a dinner party with fascinating guests. Just guess who thought they were fascinating. True. It's okay. I really don't mind if the chat's dead and the, the uh, music died too. Yeah, I think it's totally all cool. All right, guys. So without further ado. So I've been replaying the Nancy Drew games, as you know, on... Um... Oh, hang on one second. Okay, yeah, that's the end of this section, so I'm just going to stop here.